Man, I'm excited you guys are here. First off, if you're new, let me introduce myself. My name is Mike. Have the wonderful honor of being the lead pastor here at Bloom. And if you're new, man, I am so honored you chose to spend your Sunday with us. Thank you for being here. I hope you feel welcome, loved, and at home today. I don't know about you, but man, worship really blessed me today. And I hope that's a prayer that, pray, that you pray on a regular basis. And man, we may experience God and the Holy Spirit in worship, but I don't want to stop there, right? We want to continue to feel God and have him speak to us. So hold your hands right now in a posture received from God. Before we dive into this word, we need him here. God, no talent, no charisma, your anointing. Let your words, let your voice be the loudest thing we hear. Speak to our hearts and minds. Less of me, more of you. As we read the word of God, let it come alive in our lives. Let it expose who we were created to be and plant the truths deep into our souls. And I pray anyone in this room right now that is struggling, hurting, dealing with sadness, dealing with tragedy, dealing with pain, I pray they do not walk out of here with that pain. I pray they learn to cast their cares upon a God that cares about them and walk out of here with peace and freedom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, we're in a series called Parenting with Purpose, actually week five, and I'm excited about continuing the series, but I got one announcement before we uh, move forward, and next Sunday is Dude's Day. We got Father's Day going down next Sunday, and here's what we do, man. We celebrate every single man of God, whether you're a physical father, spiritual father, or a father-to-be. We want to celebrate you, and we want to encourage you. So here's what we're going to do. We got giveaways. We got food. We got games and activities. It's going to be a blast. You don't want to miss it, and there ain't nothing better than modeling to your family. God comes first. So I want to see you guys here at church next week. Get your invite on. We're going to have a wonderful, and we're going to be wrapping up this series called Parenting with Purpose. Now, when I started this series, and you probably heard it for the first time, you probably thought, okay, this series is probably going to be like a, a, a five steps on how can you have conversations at the dinner table with your children, and like, what are, and, and we kind of went a direction you probably didn't anticipate us going in. And all those things are great, and there's a lot of wonderful practical things you can get with those. But here's what I really wanted. I really wanted this series to be about you understanding you pass something down to the generation after you. That there's a legacy you hand. And that we have the understanding that we are either passing down generational curses or generational blessings. Now that sounds heavy. And I'm not, not, that's a lot of weight, and it should be. You can't be flippant about your responsibility as a parent and also your responsibility as a disciple of Jesus. Now not just those that we physically parent, but those that we spiritually parent. There's a responsibility on what we are handing down to the generation coming after us. And so as I was studying for this message, I came across a story that kind of really painted the picture for me, really stood out to me on how we should focus and the way we should think. It's a story from a couple guys that you're probably familiar with. Those crazy Cajuns, Boudreaux and Thibodeau. How many people want to hear a Boudreaux Thibodeau joke? Come on! Them crazy Cajuns for the Bayou. Boudreaux and Thibodeau said, hey, Thibodeau, let go to Canada, get us some mooses. So Boudreaux and Thibodeau said, yeah, buddy, we going to get us some mooses. So they go all the way up to Canada. They hire them, one of them Canadian pilots, and they fly deep into the woods. They hunt for a couple days, and guess what? They bag themselves six moose. They're so excited, they bring them to the plane, and the pilot goes, whoa, 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 whoa. We can't load six mooses in here. That's too much weight. This plane can only handle four with us three in it. And they go, whoa, 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 whoa. Last year, we killed ourselves six mooses. We loaded them all up into the plane. That pilot led us, and he had the exact same plane as you. So after a little bit of arguing, finally the pilot said, fine, let's load them up. So they load them up, they take off, and they're cruising, but that little old plane is struggling, and it can't handle the weight. Next thing you know, it crashes in the middle of the woods. Boudreaux and Dibodeau, they climb out of the wreckage. Boudreaux is scratching his head. He goes, oh, Dibodeau, where you think we be at? Boudreaux looks, Thibodeau looks around and goes, I think we about the same place we crashed at last year. Come on. <laughs> hey. 
I've been learning that. That's a good one. That's a good one. Here's what you got to understand. You keep doing the same things you always done, you'll always be what you always been. Here's what I want you to get in your spirit. If you parent out of your instincts instead of intentionality, you will never parent up to your purpose and your potential. And if you lead just from your instincts but not being intentional, you will never lead up to your potential. There has to be an intentionality in your life. You have to have this stirring that there's got to be some things that you got to change and, and you can learn from and you can grow and you can be effective. And not only that, there is a God-given calling and mandate on your life to be that. And so we're going to talk today, and I'm going to really break down a scripture that you might not have heard or you don't really understand the significance of it. And I'm actually, this whole series has been based loosely around a book my spiritual father wrote called, Pastor Scott Wilson wrote, called Parenting with Purpose. And we, we've got those books in the lobby if you'd like to grab one. They're powerful, wonderful. But Pastor Scott actually spoke this verse over me about two or three years ago, and it stood out to me ever since then. And it's actually in the very end of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. So if you have your notes, pull them out, and you can follow along on the screen. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord rives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. And in a beautiful scripture. And in a powerful prophecy. And a wonderful thing to get in your spirit. Now let me interject something real quick. This isn't a gender thing. This is an influence thing. See, in those days when this was written, fathers are who had the inheritance rights. They had the authority to pass the inheritance on. And so what this scripture is basically saying is that there will be a point whenever a father realizes what his intention is for his children and what drives him, and he will pass an inheritance to his children, and that's what drives it. Everything that motivates inside of his spirit is to pass along what he is supposed to pass along. But as he has this motivation in his spirit, what happens is all of a sudden, the children realize that's the, the, uh, the heart of their father or their mother or that spiritual parent in their life, and they don't not only see it modeled, but they want to cast it down to the generation that follows them. It's a domino effect. There is this power in understanding the inheritance you pass on. It is God-given and it is powerful. Watch what Proverbs says. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. See, it's not just that I want my kids to have a decent life. It's that I want to build an influence into my children, an inheritance in my children that they take and they pass to their children. So much so that it'll happen generations and generations and generations after I'm gone. There is a mandate upon us. So let's jump back into Malachi chapter 4. I want you to see this again. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah now, you got to understand, when Malachi's writing this, Elijah has already come, and Elijah's already gone. Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. Now, what he's talking about when the Lord arrives, what he's talking about is Jesus is coming. There will be a Messiah that comes. And he's saying it's a good and a dreadful day for two reasons. Number one, it's good because when Jesus comes, there's going to be a new covenant. And when you experience the forgiveness of Jesus, it's not going to be like it is in the Old Testament in these days. That your sins won't just be pardoned, they will be gone. You will be pure before the eyes of God, so much so that you can have intimacy to God. You can actually step into the presence of God. You can actually talk to God yourself. You can have a connection with God. How beautiful is that? Now, it's dreadful because though that is such a beautiful gift, many people won't choose it. Many people will not choose Jesus' forgiveness. They won't choose Jesus' grace. They won't choose Jesus' freedom. They won't choose to have intimacy with God. They'll choose themselves and the things of this world. That's a dreadful tragedy. And then he makes a statement, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah. Now what he's saying is, I'm not sending you physically Elijah. I'm sending you the spirit of Elijah. And that spirit will rest upon someone. 
Now, I talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? I talked about this a couple weeks ago where there was a gentleman named John the Baptist and his responsibility that God called him to be the messenger that proclaimed Jesus was coming. That's where the spirit of Elijah rested upon. It rested upon John the Baptist and his preaching. What is it saying? His message is starting to change that there is a mandate that's coming with the new coming of our Savior, with Jesus coming on board. There's a mandate shifting. No longer do you live your spirituality for yourself. No longer do you live just so you can be obedient to God. You now have an inheritance given by God that there's a mandate you are to pass down to the generation after you. There is supposed to be a move. So as I'm studying this, I started asking myself a lot of these questions. I go, why the spirit of Elijah? Like, I mean, there's lots of great prophets in the Bible. Why not the, the spirit of both Jeremiah, the spirit of Moses, spirit of Joshua? Like, great heroes of our faith. Why, why not those spirits? It's because God wanted us to see the way Elijah went out, left this earth, and we're supposed to do the same. And so today I want to talk about Elijah and I'm, I laid out this message a little bit differently. So as I talk about Elijah, I feel like it's going to pose several questions in our spirit that are hard questions to ask ourselves, but we desperately need to. But let's talk about Elijah for just a second. Elijah, one of my favorite dudes. Elijah got the biggest swagger in the world. Like he bold. He says whatever he wants. He does some powerful things. Like Elijah was so bold, he would stand before a, a king that could take his life in an instant, and he would basically say, you're being disobedient. You're being wicked right now. And because of that, God is going to now put a famine on this country. And for three years, there was no rain. Famine swept throughout the country. When he first said it, nobody believed him, but that's what happened. And, and then ravens came and fed him, and, and he saw the miraculous provisions, and widows started having miracles, and he stayed with them. I mean, it was cool. It was awesome. And three years into the drought, Elijah finally says, you know what? It's time to have a showdown. So he calls 450 prophets of the false god Baal to come show, show down. And they build these altars, and he says, here, if your god's real, call fire from heaven. And if my god's real, I'll call fire from heaven. Y'all go first. So they start chanting and hooping and hollering, and they cutting themselves with knives, which there alone, you can tell that's weird, okay? And they're doing all this stuff, and here's what Elijah does. He goes, what's up? What's up? Your God, is your God sitting on the toilet relieving himself? Like, I love this dude. He just said whatever he wants. And then he's like, move out the way. He throws a bunch of water all over it, so much so that it starts filling up a trench around it because he wants them to realize this isn't a trick of man. This is only from God. He prays and fire comes from heaven, swallows up the altar. All of a sudden, he rallies the people and says, literally, slaughter these false prophets that are trying to remove God from this nation and trying to turn the children of God away from him. And they literally wipe them out. And then he looks at the king and says, guess what? They're about to be rain tonight. Three years, no rain. They're going to be rain tonight. So he goes up on a mountain, and he takes his head, and he places it face down in the ground, and he starts praying for rain. He asks his assistant, he says, go check, is there any rain clouds? One time, no. Two times, no. Three times, nah. Four times, nah. I would probably give up, right? Like, if you pray four times, nothing happened, you'd probably be going, it's probably the Chinese I ate last night, right? <laughs> Five, six times, Nothing. And then watch what happens. Watch this. Finally, the seventh time his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. Ahab is the king. Listen about that. Think about that. A little bitty cloud, size of a hand. Elijah knew that was the answer of God. How many times are we praying for something and God starts so small in our lives and what do we do? We just ignore it and it dissipates. Nah, I can't be a God. I was expecting big God. Part the clouds, God. We don't realize our fuel is what expands the things of God. 
our faith builds it and starts to see the move of God. So he jumps to his feet and says, that's it. And he says, go tell the king the rain's coming. And watch what happens. If you don't hurry, the rain's going to stop you. And soon the sky was black with clouds and heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm. And Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into this belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. Think about that. He prays, rain happens, and all of a sudden, pew, pew, super speed. He outruns horses and chariots. He's like flash before flash. How awesome is that? Or is it? I heard a pastor pose this question. Isn't it Pastor Gerald Brooks? And he said, what if God didn't give Elijah super strength so he could run fast? What if he gave him super strength for what he needed next, but he, Elijah used it in the wrong place? What if he never intended him to run faster than horses? What if he intended him to have the strength to stand firm? What if he didn't intend him to flee from his enemies, but what if he intended him to be resilient and have resolve in his faith and not move because what happens next is so crazy. See, the king's wife was a woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel was a full out follower of Baal, hated God and his followers. And when she finds out that Elijah literally wiped out her prophets, she swears, I will kill him. I will wipe him off the face of the planet. It will be my last thing I do if it takes me to my dying breath. And in immediately when Elijah heard her call this to him, he flees with fear and runs and hides to a place, not only running and hiding, but he gets to a place of utter depression so suicidal, he asked God to take his life. How could a man who literally saw fire come from heaven and consume it, wipe out 450 false prophets, pray and see such a powerful miracle, run so fast that passes out uh, horses and chariots, be so scared of one woman? Because maybe he used his strength in the wrong places. Which got me asking the question, are we using our God-given energy in the wrong places? Are we fighting the wrong battles? See, I don't think he was supposed to use it to run fast. I think he was supposed to use it to have resolve against the attacks of someone that was trying to stop the move of God. I don't think he was supposed to use it for convenience in his life. I think he was supposed to use it because he knew there was a, God knew there was a test that was coming his way. How many times do we use our energy in the wrong places? How many times do we go to our workplaces and we drain ourselves of our energy so when we come home, we got nothing left in the tank for our family? We come home and we just get on autopilot. We got to recharge. We need some me time because guess what? I got a place I got to go back tomorrow to give my whole self to. How many times do we use all of our energy and every ounce of our passion and desire to accumulate things and, and enhance our hobbies and go on vacations and build a bank account and we store up treasures on this earth that moth and rust can destroy and thieves can steal, but we don't use our energy to store treasures in heaven that makes an eternal difference in this world and has an internal impact. What if we're fighting battles God never called us to fight. What if we're so focused on fighting the battle against people's political differences than us, and we're more worried about being right, and we're less worried about the fact that people are dying every single day and going to hell? What if we're more motivated about how people have a different opinion than us, and how we can set them straight, and go on our long tangents online, and we're less concerned about the brokenness and the hurting people all around us what if we were supposed to be like Paul I mean Paul was oppressed by a pagan government he was hunted down trying to be murdered by a religious establishment he was beaten 
He was starved. He was whipped. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He was placed in chains where he wrote many letters to the church. And he says, I've went through all of this so people could experience the move of God and souls could be saved. Paul didn't fight his inconveniences. He ministered through his inconveniences. Paul didn't run away from what was an opposition. He ministered through the opposition because he used his energy where God called him to use it. Are we using our energy in the wrong places? And then wonder why we have nothing left in this tank when the world wants to hit us again and again. So Elijah runs. He's in a depressed state. He's asking God to take his life. He's suicidal. And God starts speaking to him. And God takes him to Mount Sinai. Now that's not a coincidence. He takes him to Mount Sinai because Mount Sinai is the mountain where God actually spoke his very first covenant to the people of Israel. It's the place where God says, you are my people, and you are chosen, and I have a plan for you. So he calls Elijah to this place almost as a reminder, hey, 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 I didn't forget this covenant. I didn't forget that the people are chosen, and I have a plan for them. And and it's at this mountain that that the earth starts shaking, and the Bible says God's not in the earthquake, and the wind starts blowing, and and it says God's not in the wind, and fire starts erupting, and God's not in the fire. But all of a sudden, there's a whisper, and Elijah covers his face because he knows that's God. See, this is the beautiful thing about God. God is not your chaos. He's the whisper in the midst of your chaos. But listen to me. You can't hear a whisper unless you're close. So many times you see all the chaos around you, but you're not running to God. You're running away from God, and you wonder why you don't hear him. You got to get close. And it was there, Elijah goes, what are you doing? What are you doing here, Elisha? And Elisha goes through this tangent, God, I, I've served you faithfully and I've given you my life, but, but all the followers of God are gone and I'm the only follower left and now they're trying to kill me too and, and I'm all about myself and I'm all alone and what's the point? And then in this moment, God speaks to Elijah. And watch this. Go back the same way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram. I named Jehu, grandson of Nimish, to be king of Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel to replace you as my prophet. Watch this. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Do you realize, Elijah, you ain't alone? Do you realize there's 7,000 other people that have not bowed? You think you're all by yourself. You think you're carrying all this weight alone. You think that, that this is what's the point and, and we've already lost and we've already been defeated and the world looks too dark and, and, and the government's completely against God and, and everybody online looks crazy and what's the hope and, and everybody's changed and everybody's different. But don't you realize there's still 7,000 that never faltered that way? Which leads me to the second question I ask myself. Are we constantly remembering what is most important? And what is God's original call and promise? He calls him at Mount Sinai. He speaks this into him. And what does he tell him? Go back to where you came. Go back to your calling. Go back to your mission. Go back to your legacy. You have someone you have to anoint. You have a mantle you have to pass on. There's a young man named Elisha that needs you to take the anointing God gave you and put it into his life. There's someone you need to mentor. There's someone you need to father. There's someone you need to pass something on to. You're not called to die with the anointing yourself. You're called to build a legacy and pour into the generation that's going to follow. So Elijah leaves. Several verses later, watch what happens. So Elijah went And found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12 teams. Now, we know this is Elisha's oxen because what he does next. 
So we kind of gather the figure. If there's 12 of them, that means his family owns 12 sets. So they have to be some sort of wealth in that family, a large operation. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Doesn't say a word, just walks away. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. That's cool. Elisha's out there plowing the field. Elijah walks by, throws his coat on, walks off like dropping a mic, and all of a sudden Elijah knew exactly what that meant. But guess what he did? He slaughters his oxen. He don't go, hey, mom and dad here, can you hold these for me? He takes the plow and builds a fire, roasts the meat. What's he doing? He's saying, I'm all in. I ain't going back to this old way of life. When God calls me, I'm all in. Which actually gives me the third question I ask myself. Do you have a plan B with God? So here's the problem I have a lot of people. Pastor Mike, why am I not seeing changes in my life? Why is God not answering my prayers? Why is God not moving the way that he's moving with him over there or, or with you over there? Or why is he not? It's not because they're special and you're not. It's not because they're chosen and you're not. It's because you still have plows you refuse to burn. It's because you don't want to fully let go of your old way of life. It's because you still have a plan B with God. God, I will live for you up to a certain point. But I'm still going to be one foot in and one foot out. Can I tell you, nothing's more depressing than that spiritually. Nothing's more unsatisfying than that to get a taste of something but never be able to feast on it. And it's not because God wants to keep it from you, it's because you want to keep it from yourself. Jesus says, you can't be kingdom-minded and plow a field while you keep looking backwards. And some of you keep looking back at your old life and your old environments and your old behaviors and your old actions and you can't let go because you refuse to burn it. Burn the bridge so you can't go back. You have to have a burn the plow moment in your life. That's what Elisha did. Now here's the thing about Elisha. He goes and serves Elijah, and that's all you hear. The whole rest of the book of 1 Kings, you never hear him mentioned again. You get into the second book, you don't hear anything about Elisha. He's not famous. He's not getting applauded. His name is not known across the world. He's not internationally known. Like Nothing. It's literally like, Peep, silent, burn some ox, eat them, gone, don't hear from him. You actually don't hear from Elisha until the very last days of Elijah. Second Kings chapter 2, watch this. Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided and the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you. Before I'm taken away. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You've asked for a difficult thing. Jesus said a similar statement to his disciples. You don't know the cup you're about to drink from by asking for that. If you see me when I'm taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. When I hear Elisha asking for this request, it makes me think this. Do you understand the earthly price of an eternal calling? John Maxwell says it like this. You have to give up to go up. You got to give up to go up. Then when the price is low, everybody will bid on it. It's when the price is high, only the true world changers are willing to make that sacrifice. Anybody can live for themselves. Anyone can be me first. Anyone can be selfish and motivated and only think about what's in it for them. Anyone can live based in the the confines of your conveniences and never stretch yourself. Anyone can be undisciplined. Anyone can live for whatever you want to live for and never sacrifice it. That's easy. 
And that's what most of the world does. But true world changers, true disciple makers, true legacy givers realize daily I have to die to myself. Because see, giving is the nature of God. God so loved the world that he gave. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. If you are to be a leader, you have to be a servant. The first is last. The last is first. I choose to walk down a narrow path. I choose to live. Listen to me. It's inconvenient to give your children everything. When you've worked through life and you're stressed at work and you're dealing with issues and people. But can I tell you something? It's what we do to leave an inheritance of worth and value into our children. It's frustrating to mentor and pour into people that are not where you are spiritually. And keep acting a fool time and time again. But you've got to build the heavenly patience to realize one step closer to God is worth every celebration I get. Because one step closer, I'm going to cheer you on. Could you get one step closer? I'm going to scream like heaven, the heroes of heaven because I cannot wait for the day that you're celebrating and cheering on those around you. Do you understand the price? So Elijah sees The chariots of fire come and take him away. And Elisha, watching all of this unfold right before his eyes, how cool is that? doesn't even die. Literally, it's taken away. And watch what Elisha says. My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. I see it. That means the anointing's passing to me, the mantle. And Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he was taken up. And then Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elisha's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided, and Elisha went across. And when the group of prophets from Jericho saw from a distance what had happened, they exclaimed, Elijah's spirit rests upon Elijah. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. There was a transfer. And if you actually read, Elisha does some crazy miracles. He actually, if you actually count up how many miracles Elijah has recorded and how many miracles Elisha, it's, it's like double. He has a double portion of anointing. He does some crazy things. He's got the swagger. Some amazing things happen in Elisha's life. But I don't want to focus on that. What I want to focus on very quickly is what did Elisha do when he left? Did he leave like Elijah or not? Let's jump all the way to chapter 13. When Elisha was in his last illness, King Joash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel, he cried. Isn't that exactly what Elisha said when he saw Elisha? This king is saying the exact same thing. You know what he's saying? You're about to leave this earth And you haven't passed your mantle on to anyone. You're about to leave this earth and you haven't left the legacy. You're about to leave this earth and no one has your anointing. And he's basically saying, give it to me. I want it. Just like Elisha asked for that from Elijah. Give it to me. And the Bible says Elisha tells him, Go get some arrows, and these arrows represent the victory of Israel. And he says, bang them on the ground, and and he bangs them three times. And Elisha gets so mad, he goes, why'd you stop at three? You just had enough faith to win a battle. If you would have banged it five or six times, you could have won the war. And he leaves frustrated and angry and walks out. Now, you would think Elisha would leave, and the Bible would say he would go and find someone else to pass the legacy on to. He would go find someone else to mentor, find someone else to give his his inheritance to. But actually, very next verse, watch what happens. He died and was buried. That's a letdown. That's a cliffhanger. Bam! Died and buried. No inheritance passed. No legacy left. No mentee that he passed his anointing to. He died and he's buried. Verse 20. That's just part of verse 20. Watch what it goes on to say in verse 20. Groups of Moabite raiders 
used to invade the land each spring. So we know immediately it says he's died and buried, and then it jumps basically probably at least a season, so months away from when he died, maybe longer than that. Once when some Israelites were burying a man, they spied a band of these raiders. So they hastily threw the corpse into the tomb of Elisha and fled. But as soon as the body touched Elisha's bones, the dead man revived and jumped to his feet. How cool is that? Elisha had been dead for months, maybe years, and a dead man touches it and comes back to life. I used to think that was the coolest story ever. He was so anointed, dead people come back to life. That's actually the tr most tragic story ever. He took his anointing to the grave with him. He was buried with his, how selfish is that? He was buried with his anointing. If the math adds up, if Elisha got a double portion of anointing, then he should have handed off a quadruple portion of anointing. And then it should have been eight times the anointing. And then 16 times, and, and 32 times, and 64 times, and 128 times, and 256 times. And it keeps going. Like, like it should have been a movement of God that changed the face of the world. And he died with his anointing? Which asks the question, are you on the path of taking your anointing to the grave with you? You may look successful on paper, but none of that matters if you're not successful in heaven. Are you going to be like the servant that buries your talent or multiplies your talent? Are you a legacy giver or a legacy hoarder? Our calling is to leave the next generation bigger, better, stronger, and more anointed than us. We're to father and mother, sons and daughters that becomes fathers and mothers of sons and daughters. My pastor Scott Wilson tells me all the time, he says, you're not called for a stage ministry, you're called for a shoulder ministry. You're not called to stand on a platform for people to look at, you're called for your shoulders to be a platform for people to stand higher than you ever did. We're called to leave the next generation bigger, better, stronger, and more anointed than us. See, that's how the first century church was motivated by they weren't motivated by selfish gains. They were motivated by generational impact. It's why Acts 2 says it like this. Pastor Mike said this first earlier. In the last days, God will say, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I'll pour out my spirit even on my servants. Men and women alike, they will prophesy. Do you see? Children and older, young and old, men and women, that there is a generational impact we are called to be as a church, which leaves me with this question. Are we going to be a multi-generational church that is filled with disciples multiplying themselves into other disciples? Are we going to care about the legacy we give. I'm going to end with this story. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus says, there's a story about a farmer sowing seed. And he starts scattering the seed. And the Bible says some of the seed fell on a pathway where the birds came and took the seed. And it represents how the devil comes and just snatches away the word of God from people. Some fell in some shallow soil. And, and that plant grew quickly. But there was rocks in that soil, so the roots could not grow, and it withered away quickly also. Representing sometimes people get excited about God, but they don't remove the things in their life that's keeping them from growth. And he says, some seeds fall into the weeds and the thorns, and, and they grow, but the pressures of this world choke them out. They're, they're more focused about money and affirmation and the applause of man 
and they're motivated by the temporary, not the eternal. And then he says, but some, some fall on fertile soil and they see a 30, a 60, even a hundred fold increase in their life. They multiply themselves. And the question is, what seed are you? Are you the seed that God's trying to speak things into your life, but you just let the devil rob you every time? Are you the seed that, that you, you like the thought of God, but you just refuse to remove the rocks, those unhealthy things from your life, so you can actually be what God called you to be? Or are you the seed that when the pressures of this world and the motivations of this world surround you, that's what you focus on, and it chokes out your God-given identity? Or are you the fertile seed? Now, it's one thing to identify it. It's another thing to give your life to God. And when you pray a prayer to ask God into your life, what you're saying is, this is a statement into your spirit and yourself, I am willing to take steps every day to get less of me and more of you into my life. I won't instantly be perfect, but I'm making the commitment that I want to remove the rock time and time again, the thorns, the weeds time and time again, so that I can get to the fertile place in my life. And there's some people in this room right now that need to start that journey with God. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus in your life. Maybe you've never accepted his forgiveness in your life. And today is that first day where you make the commitment, God, I'm taking the first step, and every day I'll get a little bit closer to you to be who I was called and created to be. Maybe you have in the past. Maybe there have been times when you were excited and you withered away quickly. Maybe there were times when you, you wanted the things of God, but you were choked out by the things of this world. Maybe there were times where you wanted what God had, but the devil just kept taking it. And you just believed his lies over and over again. But today, you're changing that mindset, and you're making a decision. If that's you in this room right now, we're all going to pray this prayer together. So I want everybody to bow your heads. Nobody looking around. Please, no moving around. This is the most important thing we do in this church building. Take your hand and place it over your heart. It's a symbol of your soul. And repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe your blood washes away all sins. Come be a part of my life. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I matter. And I give you my life. Holy Spirit, move right now. Heal right now. Forgive right now. With every head bowed, I want nobody looking around. Just me and you. If you made that commitment today for the first time, or you recommitted your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do something crazy. In just a second, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. You may say, why, why would you do that? Because symbolism reminds us of things. And I want this to be a reminder in your life. You're not plowing a field any longer looking backwards. You're burning the plow. Today, you are sealing it in your spirit. You're leaving here a new creation. The old is gone, and the new is here. I want you excited. I want you passionate, and I want you walking out of here intentionally knowing you are walking towards your future in God. So on the count of three, I want to see hands all over this place raised. One, don't be afraid. Two, we're going to celebrate together. Three, get your hands up right now. See your hand. See your hand, 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 see your hand right over here. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Come on, church, get excited. You can do better than that. We got family in the building. Come on. Nothing gives my heart more joy than this moment. And I am so honored you let me pastor you in this moment. I can tell you this is the start, not the end. God's going to bring you through freedom. You're going to discover purpose. You're going to make a difference in this world. And it's a journey to bloom into everything you're created to be. And this church wants to be in your corner. We want to help you go on that journey. But listen to me. 
we can't connect with you and help you if you don't connect with us first. So I'm going to ask you something. Whether you raise your hand or not, I'm going to ask you to do something very big, very bold. At the end of service, I would love to give you a free gift. It's a book called Following Jesus. You can get it in the upper lobby or the lower lobby welcome center. It's going to talk about our faith, answer questions you may have, and give you some next steps you could take. Or you could text next steps to the number right here. And let's see you bloom at everything you're created to be. Guys, I want to end with this thought. Let me Give me two seconds. I promise I'm almost done. Not only was Jesus talking about the seeds, about how you can be a different type of seed, he was also talking about the sowers. And he says, you're going to be, as leaders in this world, you're going to pour your life into people. And some people are going to believe the lies of the devil. And some people are going to get excited at first, and then they're going to wither away. And some people are going to be more focused on, on the things of this world, and it's going to choke them out. But some, some will be fruitful. And he says, sometimes you're going to be pouring, you're going to pour your life into people. And you're going to be like, God, I don't see nothing happening. I don't see any lives being changed. But God's trying to tell you something. You may not see it with your human eyes, but God's doing something in heaven. There are lives being changed that you might not be able to see with your own eyes. But if you keep pouring, and if you keep mentoring, and if you keep serving, and if you keep loving, and if you keep sowing into people, that there's going to be hundreds changed, thousands changed, lives are going to be changed. You're going to populate heaven and depopulate hell. You might not be able to see it right now but one day you'll stand before God and he'll say well done my good and faithful servant I gave you a little and you did a lot why because we passionate disciples of Jesus we're pursuing our created design walking in our God-given purpose and making a difference that echoes for all eternity love you guys see you back next week